Hi, uh, this is, uh, my name is Michael Fox Higgins. I'm sitting here with uh, Bob Daltrey. Um, Bob, uh, I'm just going to run through a couple questions with you about uh, about you know, your experience in, in uh, the military and, and serving and stuff like that. Um, I know we were talking earlier and you said that you uh, you started when you graduated in 1949 from high school. Yeah. You want to take it from there? Well, I graduated from high school in 1949 yep. in June. Yeah. July 1st, I was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Yeah. Going to school, artillery surveying school, three months. Okay. They said you're going to eat survey, do survey, and then survey. And we did. What um, What exactly was the uh, land what, what survey? Was it, what, was, what was it like when you were there? Next school? Yeah. Oh, it was nice. Yeah. It was, uh, I was on a good vacation. But it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I had to bring a land for it from a trick station mm -hmm. and bring the coordinates down to your battery, which was the artillery battery. Mm -hmm. So that they could take and pinpoint one battery, one uh, artillery uh, piece to a target area because you had six, you had six uh, artillery pieces. Yeah. And you take the, uh, you take the center battery, or as close as you can, and use that as a base piece. Yeah. And that's the one that they put the pin in and by a direction. Oh, okay. And then when the forward observer comes back with coordinates, they take and attach it up and they use a span on it and. Up they go. How uh, how many guys did you work with to run a run a? Uh, well, my battery. Well, it's been to, uh, for the party. Yeah. Party was only six men. Six men. Yeah. It was myself. I was the uh, chief of party. Yeah. And I was also the instrument operator. Then I had a recorder. He did all. He wrote down all the uh, mathematics. Yeah. That I gave him. And I had two men that were tape men. Yeah. What did the tape men do? They taped the distance where I would tell them to put the forward stake out, which would okay. probably be maybe 100 yards, 200 yards. Then you try to hit that stake? No. Then I got the angle to it. Oh, okay. They did the distance. I did the angle. Then we draw what they call a traverse. I traversed all the way to the battery. Oh, no way. Huh. That's, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty, pretty intense. Oh yeah, it's, it's yeah. Well, when, you, isn't it? when you when you're doing it in the in the states, it's pretty intense. But when you get over like overseas, it's not <laughs> because you got people going to want they don't want you out there. You know they want yeah. to shoot you. Yeah. And sometimes they didn't want to shoot you. They throw a round out at you. Yeah. You know, try and scare you, to throw you off, or kill you one or the other. Yeah. When you're in the field, how does it differ? Like how do you how do you get your coordinates if you don't have the stake man running out? Well, no, I I uh, have to start at a trick station. Yeah. The trick stations all over the world, mm -hmm. and those are uh, how you get your coordinates and where you're supposed to be for a map. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, nice. That's that's uh, that's pretty interesting. It uh, seems a lot like uh, surveying me because I. Well, it's like even surveying uh, property here. Yeah. Same. You have to think to find out where the trick station is. You go from there to yeah. people's property, and then you take an outline of property and tell them this is one point. Other point, because no uh, land lot is square. Yeah. None of them are square. I don't know why, but <laughs> none of them are square. Yeah. And that's how you tell your people as you're saving, this is this is your property yeah. within these boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. When you uh, when you left for um, for Oklahoma for training, did you uh, did your how did your family feel about you leaving and going into the military? Well. I was graduating high school. It was a it was a little traumatic, you know, because yeah. I wasn't going to be home. Yeah. And uh, I was off to take and become a man. Yeah. <laughs> More or less. To yeah. Speak. So I didn't really didn't have any, um, I'll just say, uh, uh, junior uh, home life or hanging on the corners or anything because yeah. when I came back, I came back in uh, September the end of September, and the rest of that year was, uh, see, I was in the National Guard. Okay, yeah. And then the following year, almost on the zero. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> that was the coldest. Yeah. But it wasn't bad, though, because it was dry. Yeah. Dry cold. Myself being from New England, most of us were, this kind of weather up here is awful damp. Yeah, it is. And we used to be running around there in our fatigues, and for a science, saying, are you crazy? Why? Do you know what the temperature is? Yeah, about 20. 
Yeah, it's 20 below. It's not 20 <laughs> above, it's 20 below. <laughs> so, you know, then uh, we got word. They're going to need a school again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were sending me back to Fort Sill. Where's Fort Sill? Uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma? Yeah. Is that the one you were at originally? Originally, yeah. Okay. They were sending me back there for some more training. Then they got orders to, we were going overseas. Yeah. But uh, it never transpired. Oh, no? No. No. Somebody said we were, well, not piss poor, but someone was trying to say that we weren't up to snuff. Up to snuff to get so over So we had to take another the battery, the, I should say not the battery, but the battalion, had to take an, uh, a test. Oh, really? Yeah. All of our equipment had been cosmoline and everything ready to ship overseas. So they took all of our good equipment and they gave us crappy equipment. And so there you go. Oh, some of, some of the tractors didn't have motors in them, some of it didn't work, the trucks were all screwed up. Really? So we had to take and make do with what we had. Yeah. And we passed the course with flying, we passed that test with flying colors and somebody watched and said, what the hell, what's wrong with them people? <laughs> That outfit is good. How did that, uh, when they said you weren't good enough, that that, uh, that kind of stung you? You were kind of upset about that? Yeah, I was, because I was in Oklahoma at the time when it came down, because I was supposed to leave from Oklahoma to go to uh, uh, Washington, mm -hmm. and uh, Seattle, Washington, Yeah. and take a catch up with the like, Italian, Italian there. To, and, uh, either they were going to be there or already overseas. Yeah. See? But I had to come back to back all the way back to Oklahoma back to Oklahoma after flying all the way up to back Seattle. To, back to Boston. Oh, back to Boston. Yeah. Oh, wow. well, not Boston. I'm talking back to Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay. Then finally, uh, during the fall, we got orders to take and go again. We were going overseas. So our outfit, instead of going to Korea, which we were originally slated for, yeah, they shipped us to Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. And we were playing. We were playing footsies with the uh, the Russians. Yeah, oh, that's right during the, the Cold War, right? Yeah. But uh, the our, our outfit was what they call it, was designated as a non-combat outfit. Mm -hmm. And non-combat didn't mean you didn't go into combat. No. No. Non-combat meant that they could take anywhere from one man to one one gun battery or one howitzer, mm -hmm. and they could ship it wherever they wanted to. Yeah. One time they woke me up about 2.30 in the morning, told me to be very quiet. Told me to get my fatigues on and uh, draw my weapon. And okay, my full field back. And I go down, I get into a truck. The way I go, I get to a staging area and he says, okay, and I'm stripped. Huh? I had to take all my clothes off and put on everything that didn't have a mic on it. Really? You no, know, didn't have a mic on it. The only thing is my boots, uh, they didn't get boots because you already broke in your boots. Yeah, you don't want your ones. Yeah. So they obliterated the, uh, my uh, serial number on my boots. Really? Yeah, they had to give me everything new, new steel part. Everything was brand new. <laughs> why, why did they do that? Because I was going someplace that, uh, I wasn't supposed to be. They were send, sending you over there? They were sending me over to take and do a job, and if I got killed, they would have had, uh, I would have been reported as being killed in training. Oh, really? And if I got wounded, they had papers that said I got wounded in a training accident. Oh, really? And if I got caught, it was like, oh, the poor bastard went, uh, Went someplace where he wasn't, so forget about him. Really? Yeah. Wow. That was uh. Yeah, but I got back though. I come yeah. back. I come back. I was a bad fit. He came back. There was, <laughs> had one officer. He didn't like me. No. 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 He didn't like me. Why? Why do you think that was? Well, I was taking a test, and I run the survey. I run it early. I come back, I recomputed the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, she'll be back in a moment. Have a seat oh. out here. <laughs> I didn't want to mess up your old video. Oh, there's a chair down, down there by the table. So, uh, we, uh, 
You mean had words. Open? Yeah. Because the testing crew will come in, told me I was 200 mils up. Mm -hmm. And the major that was in charge of it, he says, how could it be? He says, my God, he said, the man just blew the target up. We took his coordinates, we put him down, we fired around, they blew the goddamn target up. He says, well, how the hell can you be 200 mils out? Yeah. But the way things worked out, the uh, they had to take the word of the testers. Mm -hmm. If I had been 200 mils out, there were a lot of people would have got killed. Yeah. They, because we were we were firing on a range, 200 mils is a long, long way off from five miles. Really? Yeah. Wow. You're firing on a range that's maybe three, four miles. Well, you got a fan and you get further out. They, thing escalates. Yeah. It puts the shell way out. Put the shell there instead of putting it here. But the only thing is, my end well went there and flew the target up. And we're not supposed to throw the target up. Don't ask me why, but we're not supposed to throw the target up. <laughs> I, 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 I uh, credited with, uh, they want you to come, one, one battery will come close to the target. Mm -hmm. Then when they bring all 18 guns in, it won't be a big mess out there. Yeah. 18 rounds are going out there. So you don't have to really, one gun don't have to get tired. One of them 18, well, two of them 18s will take and do a job out there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I was a bad penny, I come back. Now, when, um, when they were, when they uh, woke you up in the middle of the night and uh, told you you were, uh, you were heading out, yeah. what, uh, how'd, how'd that feel, how'd that? Uh, well, I'm young, you yeah. know, you're young, little fish and vinegar. Yeah. Hell, you, know, you don't know what it's all about. Yeah. I matter of fact, I didn't even know where I was going. Yeah. Okay. But they used to do a lot of covert uh, uh, actions because of the Russians. And half the time, you didn't know where you were going. Really? It was just like... No. We used to get a day off. Oh, yeah. Monday, get the day off. Great. You're laying around doing nothing. All of a sudden, you get a red alert. Which really? means that you got to pack up everything and you got to go to a position and sit there. Because okay. actually, uh, in Germany, our outfit was uh, a bump in the road. Mm -hmm. We were bumping the road because uh, all we was going to do was deter, slow them down. Mm -hmm. Because the first line of defense was in France. Oh, really? Yeah. Because they figured if the Russians hit attack, uh, by the time they got to France, we would, they would have been, armies would have been able to take and push back the enemy because they'd been coming so fast. But we were just like bumping the road. Really? But hey, you're young, but uh, right. yeah, it's fun and games. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Now, when you uh, when you left the United States to, uh, to come over to Germany, did, uh, did you get to see your parents and your family before you before you left? No, no. They just picked you up and that was it. Because you were already. I was I was on vacation. I was on furlough uh, in the month of August, and I was uh, uh, a chaperone with the church when the kids go to the beach mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the MDC police come down because they, they could recognize me behind my t-shirt and everything I had and they told me you gotta go you gotta call you gotta get back to your office right away mm -hmm. you yeah. well, how do I get out of here <laughs> big sign in the police station says hitchhiking is against the law he says well he says I guess you have to get out there and hitchhike yeah <laughs> but I don't know. I was kind of lucky. I got out on the road and a, a priest came along. And I explained to him what I had to do and everything. He drove me all the way to Dorchester. Oh, really? Yeah. That's not bad at all. No, because he was going somewhere in Dorchester or Quincy or someplace. Yeah. And I got the bus home and I picked up my gear and told my mother, you know, we got orders to ship out, but we don't know when and anything like that. She felt bad and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had to think, get on a train and go back. And I said, hey, this is the second time we got called like this. Yeah, how you doing? Yeah. Oh, you're interviewing, sorry. Um, now, when you uh, when you had to go do that, that operation where you uh, where they, they woke you up in the middle of the night, what um, what did you end up having to do when you were... I was taking a special instrument out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what kind of instrument it was. I couldn't even, as a matter of fact, I'm not even supposed to discuss it. Oh, really? No, at that particular time, no, and I still to this day I don't understand. Uh, I couldn't even tell you the mechanics of the instrument because it's been so long, been yeah. over 50 years. And I did it, 
I had to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I was spo not supposed to get into a firefight. Yeah. The only person that spoke English was the squad leader. How many How many of there were you that went out on this mission? There were 15. 15? 15. 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 15 South Koreans. They all spoke South Korean. The squad leader was South Korean, but he spoke English. Really? Yeah, and I wasn't supposed to get into a firefight. Did you? Well, <laughs> I said I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we did get into a couple of firefights, but the only thing is I couldn't stay. And uh, six uh, South Koreans gave up their life to get, to get me back. Yeah. Is that because of the... Well, they, they took what they called a, a decoy. They were a decoy so that we could take and move out. Really? And get me back. Yeah. So when I came back, I go back to my concern, and the first soldier comes t telling me, hey, where in the hell have you been? What? I'm cold, I'm hungry. I wasn't dirty because you can't get you can't get dirty in the sun. No. So he told me, well, he says, forget about it. Because I told him, you know where I was. He says, forget about it. He says, go put on your class A uniform, take a toilet water bath, put on your class A uniform, and go off to cross the concern for your sergeant's test. So I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. You, um, you you served in Korea, obviously. You, cause you're, you're I was only there for about six days. Six days, and six that was days, yeah. so they basically from Germany they threw you on a plane and flew you over to Korea. Yeah. And uh, no way. Uh, how long was the the flight going from Germany to? I have no idea. I slept most of the way. <laughs> yeah. How did? Uh, because when when they when you they picked you up in Germany, you know you had no idea where you were going. What? No. Uh, when when no. you go, when because you, we were always like I said we were non combat. Uh, a couple of times they took uh, three of our howitzers, and actually I had to go uh, and send them out on a training mission. Because I had to go, I had to take and serve in the battery. Mm -hmm. And we'd go out, we'd be out there maybe three, four days, five days, and uh, then we'd come back. And that was it. Mm. it that was it. So we were we were always we was always hopping going here and there. Yeah. yeah. What was the uh, what, what was it like when you're over in uh, over in Korea there for that those six days? Besides it being extremely cold, it was winter. Well, I didn't know where the hell I went. You didn't know. Well, you I just, didn't know. You just, I couldn't tell you what part of Korea I was really? in or not. They just, they just dropped you in with a uh, with a South Korean they, flu. They just dropped me in at a, at a point, and they picked up. Well, I picked. The, they were already there waiting for me mm -hmm. when they took me off to take and do this job. I was the only American, but that's the way they did things. They, they didn't want too many Americans to be going these COVID missions. You know, I caught or what not, because they'd have to answer to it. Uh, sure. But uh, there's no record. Of, there's no record. Of, none that I know. But uh, I can get my side and strike. Oh, really? No. <laughs> I got screwed out of that. Because of, because of the mission or is it because no. of because they, they transferred a master sergeant was busted into my outfit and he was taking my job as, as the uh, chief of uh, the detail section. Oh, that was the master sergeant's job. Mm -hmm. And he come in as a sergeant first class and I was only two strip. I was a corporal. I was in charge of the uh, detail section. Yeah. They, and the detail section consisted of about maybe about 15, 20 minutes. So. Because the wire section, the radio section, and the ammunition section were all part of the detail section. Plus mm -hmm. the survey. The survey crew only had about six people. Did you, um, when you were uh, when you were with the uh, with the artillery in Germany, did you ever get in, you ever got into any uh, any uh, firefights? Obviously, with, with anybody. With the Russians? Yeah. No, no. We just used to go out and we'd sit. Everything set up, ready to do whatever we had to do. Yeah. And we'd be sitting there for hours. Really? How that uh, time probably passed pretty slowly while you were sitting there? Well, yes. Yeah, sometimes it did pass slow. Other times it passed pretty quick. Really? But uh, most of the times it was pretty slow because you're in an area you don't know where you're at. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're just on the outside of a village, or other times you're out in the field somewhere. Yeah. And you always had to be hyped up and ready for everything. 
ready, I'm ready for whatever gets, yeah. whatever happens. Whatever happens, right. Yeah. How long did you, uh, how long do you stay over in Germany for? Mm, let's see. Uh, I guess about six months. Six months in Germany? Yeah. And then you got to come back home or? Yeah, that's when they sent me back home. They were mustering me out, see, because I was only supposed to be in for three years. Ah, two, three years. Yeah. And they got me on my discharge. I'm being held at the convenience of the government for 255 days. Really? Yeah, I, mean, I got that Truman year. Truman year? Yeah, remember when Truman, oh, I don't think you were born. No, I wasn't. <laughs> well, I was just about to ask you what that is. Oh, when the uh, Korean War started, uh, things were pretty tight here. So they added a year on to everybody's enlistment. Oh, really? Yeah. So, I got that Truman year, so that's why they cut on the bottom of my discharge, because I was supposed to get discharged in 51. Oh, really? Yeah. And when, when did you end up getting discharged? In 52. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that's why I ended up in three years, three years, eight months, and 15 days. That was about, uh, must have been about eight months, uh, that, uh, yeah, eight months, 24, yeah, almost eight, eight months. Really? That I was, uh, Held by the government. Hmm. Yeah. Now, why, why, why did the Truman year come out? I don't know what he, put, he added a year onto everybody. Is that because of everybody? Because what, of the Korean War. Because of the Korean War. Kind of like what they're doing now in Iraq. Right. They're, they're uh, extending it a bit. Uh, no, they're they're just extending uh, deployment. Oh, okay. They they extended deployment. That's all. All right. And if some poor guy is in there and supposed to get out, uh, well, he's he's going to have on his discharge. Uh, held at the convenience of the government. Okay. That's so you won't have any repercussions and go back and tell them you owe me this, you owe me that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What, um, were you, uh, you weren't obviously too, ex were you excited about being, uh, being held for one more year? Were you looking forward to being done? Or? No, it didn't bother me. Yeah. No, no. Because, uh, when I got out of high school, I had, well, when I was in high school, that was the thing, to join the National Guard. Mm -hmm. Because you got paid. <laughs> yeah, right you on. went to one drill a week, and every three months you get a check. And you, well, for one week, uh, two weeks you go for your uh, training in the summertime. Yeah. That, that was the fun. Yeah. See? That was the fun. You come back, you're a civilian again. Yeah. See? But uh, that was the thing back in those days, because you put extra money in your pocket. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's, then you wear a uniform. Yeah. That was the fun. I had a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, I can, I can imagine. So the um, so when you uh, when you came back from from uh, Germany, how was it when you uh, when you came back and coming back to uh, when the I States? came back to the states, I uh, went back to work too soon. Really? They they told me the doctors had told me take six months off or more before you go back to work. Why why is that? Well, because you know, I was traumatized. Yeah, they, some of the things that I'd gone through. And some of the intense training I went through traumatized you too. Yeah. So they said uh, take six months off, but I like a fool. I went and helped my boss out. Yeah. And uh, I flipped out a few times when I was working for him. You know? Yeah. He got all excited and everything like that. And, but I didn't stop. I kept on working because I needed money. Yeah. I needed money. So, what are some of the things, events that, uh, that kind of traumatized you a bit, or kind of? kind of affected you, you think? Staying awake. All night? All night. Stayed awake uh, three days at a time. And uh, some of the training was intense. Uh, like landmines and booby traps, that's an intense training. What uh, what, what goes on? Uh, that's how you learn how to dis disable them. Okay? Yeah. And they kept emphasizing that uh, you only get one mistake. You're only allowed one mistake. Yeah. And there's always somebody in the crowd that's going to say, why? <laughs> well, it's because uh, <laughs> that mistake is going to kill you. That mistake is going to kill you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the next person won't make that mistake you made. Yeah. You know? But it's funny, there's always one person in the crowd that will always say always that. Always say yeah. But then I had to come back and I had to teach that. Hmm. You know, a lot of times I was kind of upset. Am I teaching them the right way, you know? Yeah. The way I did it. Because it's a lot of stress. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they, they put you to test too. You know? One day we were going out in the field, and I was sort of dozing in my weapons carrier, and the driver put his foot on the brake, and I went out on the on the hood. <laughs> oh, he says, 
What's that? What's what? All those things sticking out of the ground in front of us that look like fins on them. I don't know. Drive over, not me. <laughs> he said, you find out what they are first. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, why me? He said, because you're in charge. <laughs> so it took me about 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, literally, it took me about 10 or 15 minutes to pull one of them bad boys out of the ground. Yeah. Because I go down to touch it, and, you know, it's like, your hands are not wet, but you wipe your hands on your something, you're gone. And you got to touch it, you know. But finally, I saw some writing on it, I pulled it out. I found out it was or about someone had put up 20 flares. Okay. A flare comes down to a parachute. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it comes down and come down in the snow or anything, it's gonna stick there with the fin still sticking up the ground. Okay. Because in the meantime it's coming down, it's burning, so the parachute burns off of it. Mm -hmm. And then it comes down. Okay. Why why what do we think they were from? So, well, we weren't the only ones training out there. Yeah. No, we weren't the only ones training. Yeah. No. Where, where was this training field? This was training in, uh, I don't remember, was Greifenweir or uh, Vilsacks in Germany. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So uh, when, you, uh, when you came back to the United States, you went back to work a little too soon. Yeah, when I came back, when I was discharged, I went back to some Matter of yeah. fact, when I got back to the States, I almost... I was told I had to turn in my field jacket and my rover coat and my steel pot before they'd muster me up. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. The only thing is, my double bag was hadn't caught up with me. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So I got held. They, they give you three tries. Okay. One week, okay. They give you about four or five days. Check and see. Mm -hmm. Well, after the third time, they called me out. They said, well, you're going to have to take a pay for that. I wasn't going to pay for no field jacket and no overcoat, no steel pot. But luckily, my duffel bag had arrived, and the same day I was being mussed out and told I was going to have to pay for it, I hurried up and turned it in. Yeah. And I got mustered out. When you, uh, when you were out, when you first, uh, first started working again, you know, with... Uh, or yeah. some of the adjustments that you had to make to kind of get back to a civilian? Well, it was strange, you know, because uh, here I am, I'm a civilian, and I uh, said to myself, I can't be working on this job all the time because I got sick and I didn't get paid. So I said, I got I to gotta find something secure. Mm -hmm. So I put my name in for everything. Yeah. Everything, including the dog catcher. I took the fireman's exam. I took the post office exam. I failed them because the tests were, were not oriented toward, the fire exam wasn't oriented toward firefighting. No? No. And neither was the post office. Really? What was so I was going in for a mail carrier. Yeah. Now what does a mail carrier have to know? If a room is uh, 24 by 10 and there's three men in there and they put a fourth man in there, how much air is he going to take? What <laughs> do I have to know that for if I'm delivering mail outside? <laughs> In a firefighting exam, they wanted to know who the Secretary of State was, who the Secretary of Treasury. Well, they had, a, they had an election when I come back. Yeah. Before I come back, how the hell do I know who's, yeah, who's were, in office? I think it was kind of tilted against yeah. you almost. Yeah. So I said, ah, what the hell? And one thing I was going to, I believe, put in for the police department. Yeah. And I ended up uh, as an apprentice at Watertown Arsenal. Doing, uh, I got called by Watertown Hospital to start a new program that they started in the foundry. Yeah. As an apprentice smoker. Mm -hmm. I graduated. Nice. Yeah. And I, uh, then they closed up Watertown Hospital. I yeah. ended up in a Philadelphia shipyard. Yeah. Then they were going to close up the Philadelphia shipyard. And I ended up uh, at the Boston Naval Shipyard. The one just, uh, just down here, right? Huh? Just down here. Yeah. And I was up at Portsmouth. You know, on T.D. White, doing hull survey on the uh, atomic subs. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from them, because they were going to close up uh, the Boston Naval Shipyard, too. Oh, really? But not right then. Yeah. But I got, got a call from them to go to uh, go to school, a new program, what they call it, the Equator Program. Mm -hmm. Oh, I said, okay, I'll take that. That wasn't bad. Yeah. Three years of trumping all over the country going to school, or anywhere from... Two weeks to eight weeks. So that was a vacation. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah it was like vacation. There was no homework. Perfect. Because it was all intensive eye training in the classroom, all mm -hmm. classroom work. And some of it was field work too. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was nice. Yeah. It was nice. And then I spent, uh, let's see, I spent a year and a half or two years as a quality assurance specialist. Yeah. Then uh, they were, wanted to transfer me to Worcester. Yeah. To uh, where they make the space suits. Oh, I didn't know they made the space suits in Worcester. No, that's where they make them. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I was there, but I, I, that's 55 miles away. Yeah. And the person in Worcester, he was going to be sent back to Boston. Just swap with says, Whoa, wait a minute. He said, No, nah, no. Nah. He said, I'll retire first. He said, But I don't want to. He says, Because I got a daughter that's just graduating high school. He says, I want to work a few more years. Because he, he could retire anytime he wanted to. Mm -hmm. He had over 35 or 36 years. And he said, I don't want to travel to Boston. He says, yeah. So we were told to see what we could do. So we switched jobs. No, it's not bad. Yeah, he stayed as the uh, Q in uh, Worcester, and I became the industrial specialist that they wanted. And I retired as an industrial specialist. I see. Now, did you uh, you feel that the military training and the stuff you learned in the military helps you out in your in your civilian life and work? And no, no. My Boy Scout training helped me out in my military life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because when I was a Boy Scout, I used to go out camping and stuff like that. Hey, when I went in the military, I knew the compass. Yeah. I knew how to read a map. I knew how to survive in the woods. Yeah. So that all helped me. Yeah. Being a Boy Scout really helped me in uh, my military training. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't feel that the military has really helped you at all? Well, yeah. It made a man out of me. Yeah. Because when I went away in uh, 49, I was a young kid. Yeah. Yeah, you were. When I came back, hey, I was a little bold when I came back. You, know? <laughs> you go on pass and go into town, and like, well, yeah, you get a little bold. Mm -hmm. But when I came back from uh, serving, for the three years, eight months, and 15 days, I was a son of a bee. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't tell me nothing. <laughs> yeah. You could tell me what to do, but make sure you know what you're telling me what to do. Yeah. See? And you don't ask a person to do something that you can't do yourself. Yeah. And when I became a drill, I was a drill instructor in the military too. And I never, uh, I never told the troops to do anything that I wouldn't do. Yeah. Because when I first became a drill instructor, I told them, I said, well, you know, let's get one thing straight. I didn't want to be here either. I wanted to be a part-time soldier, but I'm here. We have to make the best of it. He says, and you U.S.'s? Ah, he says, uh, no, I said, you R.A.'s and E.R.'s. Mm -hmm. I don't hear a damn word from you. Yeah. But you U.S.'s and N.G.'s, I may listen. What was the, uh, what was the difference? Well, this is the reserves, the regular, regular army and listed reserves, they're going to they're gonna go to what was that. Mm -hmm. But National Guard is a part-time soldier. Mm -hmm. okay? He's not there full-time. He's there. not there full-time. Yeah. That's why I feel sorry when some of these poor bastards are over there in Iraq. Not they, they, they don't know nothing about the military that well. Yeah. I mean, they weren't, uh, they're learning it now, but they're yeah. learning it the hard way. Yeah. See? So that's what I told them. I, yeah, I had a good, I had a good uh, training battery. Yeah. Yeah. They, as a matter of fact, they highly respected me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. So do you um, you feel that the uh, joining the military was a good thing? You you uh, for you at you, that for particular yourself? time it was because I was uh, I was only uh, I had just turned eleven in September of nineteen forty one mm -hmm. when the Japanese took and bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah. In the in the same intro as I was a child, I was I was playing soldiers. So yeah. I was always playing soldier, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had a collection of uh, the five and dime soldier, which I still have today. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the five and dime soldiers are. Uh, them are little military oh, lead the soldiers. Green guys? Oh, the lead ones. Lead ones. These are the lead ones. The, the little green ones you got them, either plastic or yeah, but the, the, one, the miniature ones are one to thirty-two. Mine are like one to seventy-five or something like yeah. that. One to eighteen, mine are one to eighteen. Okay. And I, uh, well, I had some setbacks. I had to take and go to some uh, mental programs, and I was introduced to Ali Pet. I don't know. He, no, you don't know him. Okay. He was a doctor, and he uh, turned me on to 
lead soldiers because I was interested in ceramics where I'd been in a foundry before. So ceramics really interested me. And, and he turned me on to uh, the toy soldiers. I went to the toy soldiers show and wow, they got the things I needed. You know? I got quite, I got the largest collection on the East Coast. Do you really? Of uh, the five and dime soldiers. No way. Yeah. Because see, I didn't, I didn't buy and sell. Buy and kept. I bought and kept. Yeah. Because see, I want to, sometime, uh, which I don't know if I'll live to do it, but I want to build some nice dioramas. Yeah. I got uh, all kinds of Jeeps, weapons carriers, uh, German tanks, and I've been tanks, mm -hmm. and I got all of, all the things I need to set up a diorama. And uh, I just haven't had time good. to sit down and do it. Yeah. Because I'm working with the veterans. You work here all over. Oh yeah, I'm a volunteer. As a matter of fact, I'm the uh, the uh, national volunteer BABS for Jamaica Plain and, and uh, Crosby Street. Sure. I oversee it. I'm the eyes and ears for national. Yeah, I think I do a pretty good job. Yeah. Yeah. I get on occasion some so <laughs> Once in a while I drive crazy. Yeah. Which you're supposed to. You're supposed to, yeah. yeah. But other than that, hey. Keep them on their toes. Yeah. So so the milk's still a big part of your life now. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And veterans, oh that's yeah. that's the number one part because uh, the D A V that's my number one wife. Mm -hmm. My, my second wife is my physical wife. <laughs> but DAV is my, my best wife because DAV helped me out an awful lot. Yeah. It's Able American Veterans because I was doing poorly, really. Mm -hmm. And I got interested in the DAV when the, my cousin died. Mm -hmm. And he his family got upset because they didn't give him the rituals or everything to recognition because he was a disabled veteran, too. Really? So I went to find out why. Mm -hmm. And I found out why, and all of a sudden, I know, hey, I'm in the DAV. Yeah. And I've been in it ever since, and they helped me up quite a bit, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because quite a few things happened to me that were in the military that uh, weren't kosher. And, Do you want to talk uh, about those? I didn't, uh, well, I'm 100%. I'm 110%. Yeah. Do you want to talk about what, what happened while you, were, while you were there that weren't exactly Well, I flipped kosher. out a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, that's about all I can want to say about it. I flipped out a few times and I got frozen. Mm -hmm. My feet, were, my boots froze to my feet. Really? And I really didn't know how to go about, you know, everything. I just went down, reported it. Next thing I know, uh, they told me, told my mother, says, no, you know, your son's too nervous. And we're going to take and give him a full exam. So they did. They gave me a full exam. And uh, they told me that I was quite nervous. And I had uh, what they call it, uh, uh, cold disabilities, mm -hmm. and well, that was all right. But I flipped out a few times. See? Yeah. Because even when I was working, one time I had to work too soon. I flipped out there twice. Yeah. And, and I, I sought treatment. I got treatment. Hey, now that's why the so, yeah. got the uh, hundred. Well, one hundred and ten percent. I only draw. You only draw hundred percent money. But yeah. There are some veterans out there at one hundred and fifty percent. But you can only draw. 100% money. Yeah. They, but uh, hey, it's helped me and I helped them. That's how I put what they did for me, I put back. Yes, yeah, so you feel like the government helped you to carry you after once oh, you came back. Yeah. yeah. Then I got interested in the National Auto Treasure Act. What's that? Uh, that was an organization that started, actually started in World War I. Mm -hmm. uh, your father may know about it. Third floor, yeah. Uh, and the reason. When the veterans came from World War One and they went to visit their comrades in the hospital mm -hmm. after the war, they noticed that they was like doing nothing. Okay. They were staring straight ahead and looking at the walls, this, that, and the other. There was nothing to do. No, it's, that's, so, that's the worst thing in the world. Yeah. So they took it upon themselves to start putting games in the hospitals, you know, playing games, doing something and for parties them. and something for them. So their minds are in Yeah. So then they made, uh, it's not an organization called National Trench Rats. The reason they took the name Trench Rats because the trenches used to be full of rats. Yeah. Yeah. And unbeknownst to the public, sometimes they get getting fed, but the rats were there to, to feed them. Yeah. Because that goes all the way back to the, the Civil War when they used to eat rats, rats too. Yeah. yeah. And that's a big uh, delicacy over in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, water rats. So 
they got shot at, I think it was in 1923. Mm -hmm. And hey, the rats have been doing good. They've been doing so, good, yeah, good work. So I've been in it, I've been in it uh, oh, since 1976. Mm -hmm. yeah, almost the same time I went into the DAV. And I would pass uh, Sector Golden Road. Mm -hmm. I would pass Dugout Golden Road. And I'm the Red Eye Nar, which is the Secretary and Treasurer. I've been in that for about 30 some odd years. And they, uh, they put him, hey, I want to resign. Here's my resignation. They look at it. Then they go into something else. Then I said, well, what about my resignation? What resignation? <laughs> the one I just handed you. Oh, what? Oh, well, I don't see no resignation. Well, I'm still doing the job. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I like the job. <laughs> Keep, keeps you young. Keeps me young. Keeps me keeps me doing something now because uh, my legs are starting to go on me. Mm -hmm. I got heart problems, yeah. and I never thought I was going to end up with heart problems. Yeah. I had a silent heart attack and never even knew I had it. Really? No. Nope. Didn't know I had it. Went to the hospital. They examined me because I was complaining about a pain in my neck yeah. and in my wrist that I couldn't get rid of. I knew that I had engine a muscle in my heart from when I was working in a foundry doing a lot of lifting and pulling and tugging. Yeah. But I was always taught how to do exercises to calm it down. Yeah. Well, I tried it on my right side, it didn't work, so I went to the hospital and sitting there and I'm like uh, kind of dizzy like. Mm -hmm. Well like do they always say, Let me have you on and they draw blood. Yeah. Then they come back and said, uh, Mr. Daltrey. You know, you had a heart attack within the last 10 days, and I told him I didn't even. No, I didn't. You didn't. I didn't have no heart attack. I said, I've been on my feet for the last 15 days, and I know exactly what I went for. <laughs> he said, well, the blood don't lie. Yeah. But they didn't let me go home. Really? No. They put me right up in the ICU. I was up in there for about, I don't know, a week, two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I found out, hey, you got heart problems. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Can't have no heart problems. Does the government take care of a lot of your medical bills for yeah. that and stuff like that? Yeah, they take care. Of, they take care of me. I got a, I got a sheet of, of uh, appointments. That's <laughs> a couple, of, more than half of that dang on page. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep them all. Yeah, because you know, that's what's keeping the VA going. Mm -hmm. A lot of veterans don't realize that if they, not only they're trying to close the VA, you know that. I didn't know that. No. Oh yeah, they're trying to close these hospitals and what. Really, why? They want us to go on welfare. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what they want us to do. I think the medical profession wants us to go on welfare. So we can feed their coffer instead of the government taking care of us. Yeah, it's kind of wrong. Especially oh, yeah. since, uh, you know, you guys gave up so much for the country, right? That's right. And every year, we get a fantastic pay raise. Yeah. A 2.5%. Mm -hmm. That's a pay raise? Congress sets up there and they give, they vote themselves at overnight a 35% pay raise retroactive. Yeah. And they only want to give us a 2.5%. You know, that's a kick in the head. Yeah, it is. Because a lot of times I ask them, I says, you know something? Have you ever had a bullet past your head? You ever heard one go by you? You ever had your flesh taken be torn apart by a piece of shrapnel or even have a bullet? Or taken be standing or sitting in a shelf off and blow you off your feet? Well, yeah, a couple of feet away from where you are. Yeah. Well, no. I said, well, we have. Yeah. We have. And why do you say that? And we don't deserve what we got. Yeah. The firemen and the police department get better uh, hospitalization than we do. Really? Oh, yeah. But uh, they still want to take and cut us. Oh. They still want to cut the VA. And I keep, that's one of my pet peeves when I talk to the veterans. They've got to use the system. Yeah. You have to use Children it. Children still being used. Children it's still well, being used. Because if it. they see that it's not being used, ah, we don't need that no more. See you later. See you later. Yeah. Close it up. Now, this is a, this is a 800-bed hospital. Yeah, it's a big was. hospital. Was. Was. Oh, really? What is it now? Was. Now it's an outpatient. Oh, really? Yeah. The in hospital is West Roxbury. There are only 250 beds there. Really? That's it. This is a big, this is a pretty big building. It's a pretty big building, sure. Yeah. Got 800, uh, can take 1,000 beds in here. Yeah. But they, they had a big thing to do about 
which hospital was going to be a hospital and which was going to be an outpatient. Well, the eight patient used to be down at Causeway Street. Mm -hmm. First, it used to be on Beacon Street. Then it went to uh, uh, Court Street. Then all of a sudden, they shifted over here. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, it's wild. Yeah, it's wild. Hobbit says, "Oh, this place is earthquake prone." It's when the heck was the last time we had an earthquake in Boston? Yeah, you know, West Roxbury is sinking. Mm -hmm. It was built on marshlands. Yeah, and sometimes we get we get a heavy, heavy amount of rain. Lots of that hospital floods. Really? Yeah, but they, they try to keep it quiet. Yeah, but they, they, that hospital, when that hospital was built, that hospital was built in uh, 1930. And it was only for heart and spinal cord injuries. Mm -hmm. okay. Brockton was built for mental health. Brockton now is... Uh, I've been down to the Brockton one. You've been down there? Yeah. Yeah, that's an outpatient one. Yeah. Uh, also, it has uh, inpatient too. Mm -hmm. But that, that, who the hell wants can go all the way to Brockton to visit someone? Yeah, it's a long way. So if yeah, if a ninety-year-old, a ninety-year-old, or an eighty-year-old wife or mother wants to go visit their kin, they can't, they can't get up. They, they get out there. How are they going to get back? Yeah. See? And West Roxbury is almost the same way. Yeah, West Roxbury is always. Yeah, West Roxbury is seven miles from here, but you try to get out there by T. Yeah, this one's perfect. It's right at the T station. Yeah. Now, the bus that, you, that runs the VFW Parkway mm -hmm. don't run as often because school's closed. Really? Yeah. Because the uh, West Roxbury High School is on VFW Parkway. Mm -hmm. During school days, the buses run up there. Friends, you get them kids to school and get them back home. Yeah. But now school's closed. So the bus stay empty and say, hey, we don't have to run that far. Yeah. So they to the hospital. By us uh, planning, they do run a bus into the hospital. But that runs at certain times. You know, they close that place up at uh, 5, 30, 6 o'clock. Yeah. Now, if you're 75, 80 years old, visiting your husband or kid in West Roxbury, you got to cross the dang on hospital to get to a bus yeah. across the highway. So you don't think the uh, the current administration is Oh, the current is administration is so wild, you know. It, they're, they're not taking care of, care of oh. their veterans. They're not, not really... Uh, you got, you got so much transportation from here. you got the green line out here. You got the, well, the, iron, uh, the orange line is just up the street. Mm -hmm. You catch a bus at the front of the hospital, you catch a bus at the back of the hospital. Yeah. Three different ways you can come. Yeah. And you can take the, uh, the elevator, the subway, and out here. Yeah. You can be coming because a lot of patients come in through North Station. Mm -hmm. Well, if they miss the shuttle from uh, Causeway Street to here, they get on the green line. And the green line drops it right out there at uh, the loop. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. See? And they're trying to say this place is it's right out of the clock picking line. Yeah. Now we get we get hurt and fall out in the street. Some Even though we have a BA card. Some. The city of Boston will not take us to West Roxbury. Really? No. Where do they take you? All the way up to <laughs> No. They take us to a private hospital. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. And they tell us, hey, do a private hospital. Hey, wait a minute now, wait a minute. Our card says VA. Yeah. We go into a private hospital, the first thing they want to know is what kind of insurance you got. I got uh, my VA. Hey, I got, I'm, the v, I'm a VA, I'm 100%. I'm, I'm what do I need insurance for? Yeah, you don't need it. The VA is my insurance. Yeah. Then you get you get hit with uh, insurance bills, you know. And yeah. you, if you come over to the VA and you've got to, it's a lot of paperwork and running around for the hospital to get paid. But in the meantime, you'll be dressed out trying to trying find to out who to see and whatnot, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Because, uh, what was it? Washington, George Washington said that they would take care of their wounded. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's in the Constitution. Yeah. yeah. But Congress and them are trying to skirt that. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is a bad thing to do. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. is. Because me, uh, even even the, the uh, veteran cemeteries, mm -hmm. I really don't approve of them. No, no, because I approve of the uh, of the city cemetery at Mount Hope. Mm -hmm. They put the concrete slab down, mm -hmm. they, and they can bury on either side of that slab. Now, when they put that stone on there, you can see the stone. Mm -hmm. You go to the veteran cemeteries, at the new ones that they got, the national cemeteries. 
the stones are all sunk. You look there, and you look across there, you're looking at a power pasture. Yeah. You don't see the stones. You don't know that it's uh... you know, Then you have to find out how to get to one place to another uh, to find out where the stones are, because sometimes they sink. It raises them up. That's not taking care of water. No, to me, it's not. Of course, they say that, but yet and still, they'll pump all that money to the punch bowl, to the, the uh, graveyard in uh, Hawaii, the graveyard in Europe, the graveyard in Korea with the upright stones, and, uh, and they, they maintain them, they demonstrate a straight out of them. That's why I'm not going to, I tell everybody, I'm not going to be buried, I don't want to be buried in a national cemetery, because mm -hmm. I want people to know where I'm at. Yeah. See? So they can find me easy, because if uh, my son gets about 75, 80 years old and he wants to find me, so if it's my grave, he'll be able to find it. He won't have to take and get the foot out of search party. Yeah. See? But that's one thing that I've been fighting with uh, certain organizations to, when I say not all VA organizations, but other organizations, that they need to impress upon that. Yeah. See? And they need to take care of the veteran more better. Yeah. Absolutely. With these budget cuts, terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Um, do, you, uh, do you want to say anything to the camera specifically about, uh, about your experience serving the military and about anything about Well, I have no, I, I, I'm not to like. anybody future I, generations. I didn't, I didn't burn my draft card, that's for sure, because I always figured one day I was going to go in the military. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay in for 20 years, but they wouldn't let me. And, uh, I wanted to work for the federal government for 40 years, but they wouldn't let me either. <laughs> I put in 34 years with the federal government, and I figured it was time to retire. Yeah. Yeah. Because they get, they get picky on when Things get quiet, they get picky. If you didn't dot an I or you didn't cross a T, your supervisor comes down, you didn't dot the I here. Yeah. See? You didn't cross a T. So, in other words, when you reach a certain age in the federal government, they want you out. Yeah. You want you out. But uh, hey, I want all you veterans out there though. Use the system. And if you don't use the system, they're gonna close it up. And if they close it up, you're gonna be standing in line in welfare because there will be no system. And you don't want to do that. Hey. Okay? Because right now the system is geared so that if you're a Iraqi veteran, you go into the hospital, you're going to go to the head of the line, which I, I approve of that. I don't, uh, I wouldn't squawk about that. I approve that. He's a young person. He needs the care. I mean, I need the care too, but uh, hey, he comes first because he's a young veteran. And all the others the same way. Use the system. He, he may not like it, but use it. Private hospitals are not always the answer because there are a lot of a lot of things in the VA hospitals that they do not allow in the private hospitals. And the benefits in the private hospital are not up to par, as far as I'm concerned. He was uh, Bob Daltrey. He, uh, he served served the military from 1949 to 1942. No, 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 no. I served oh. in, from 1949 to 1949 and 1952, 2000. Oh, uh, not okay. 2000, 1950s. 52. 1952. Yeah, from okay. 49 to 52. 49 to 52. Yeah. My bad. Uh, 49 to 52. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.